Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our Income Lab webinar today. Uh, we are excited to bring another topic around uh, retirement income, specifically focused on the distribution hatchet. I see we have some more folks joining in, so we'll give another minute or so and then kick it off. And this uh, webinar is uh, our first of many CFP CE credit webinars. So um, as long as you stay for 50 minutes, I believe is the cutoff, you will uh, be eligible for an hour of CFP CE credit. Here, see some more folks coming in. Well, we'll get started now. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, if this is your first time to one of our webinars, we are excited to have you here. Uh, we will have, uh, first half will be a presentation done by Justin Fitzpatrick and Derek Tharp, and then afterwards we will open it up for Q&A, um, in which you will see in our Zoom webinar here, there's a Q&A section where you can uh, drop in your questions, look for other people's questions, and even like and move them up in the queue, and then once we open it up for Q&A, we'll just walk through, uh, go through that queue. Um, quick housekeeping item as well, uh, we do have another webinar coming up on the 26th, so in a few weeks, I will also be eligible for CFP CE credit. I will go ahead and drop that uh, link in the chat as well uh, for folks who want to go ahead and register for that webinar. Outside of that, Derek, Justin, I see we have you both here. I think we can hear you all okay, so I will uh, go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Okay, thank you, Mackley. Thank you, Derek. Um, so today we'll be... Um, kind of returning to one of these uh, these topics that sort of straddles the, the um, two fields of sort of theory of financial planning and practice of financial planning. So we'll be talking about, um, you know, how to set up a, a way to robustly do dynamic retirement income planning. So it's very fairly clear, I think, from at this point, decades of writing and research on retirement income planning and, and, and experiences that um, planning in a static manner, meaning kind of, you know, setting up a, uh, a retirement plan at the beginning of retirement, following it to the, to the letter, um, you know, and never making changes, that, that's not a, a way to have good experiences. Um, so instead, um, there's a lot to be gained from uh, being dynamic, making changes over time, much in the way that we would in our working years. So really, um, you know, not not a difference between working years and retirement, but but a continuation. Um, but there's a big question on how exactly to do that, and then a practical question for advisors of how to scale it um, across a, a, a client population, and then, um, you know, how to do it through time in a way that is, again, robust, and we can be fairly confident that, that we're giving good advice. Um, so dynamic income planning is an area um, where there is a lot of, of research and writing over the last um, 20 or 30 years, uh, at, at least. And, you um, some of what we'll talk about today is really building on that, you know, kind of we'll point out some some places where those ideas um, are a little bit uh, problematic for, for engaging with in real life, um, but we're definitely building on those. And, you know, one reason that they can be a little problematic for, um, for actually applying with clients is uh, often when people talk about dynamic retirement income planning, it's in, in a very research-oriented context, um, or maybe theoretical context would be a better way to put it, where usually we kind of strip away all the complexities uh, of, of, a, of a possible client situation. Um, often just like this, what you see on, on, the, on the page here, which is we'll, we'll just kind of consider a, a simplified plan where all retirement income is funded by portfolio withdrawals and the, uh, the desired income level over time stays the same in inflation adjusted terms. And, and in practice, these kinds of theoretical exercises are perfectly fine when used for, for um, kind of understanding concepts in the world and so on. Um, but they, uh, 
if they break down when applied to real client situations, then we need something more, more robust. And, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, in particular, this might be more of a common type client situation um, where retirement, the, the cost of living and retirement are going to be funded via a variety of, of income sources um, that could be social security, pensions, even some part-time work, or uh, uh, you know, maybe one spouse is working earlier in retirement, uh, along with portfolio withdrawals to kind of fill in the gaps, fill in the valleys. Um, and also it may be that, uh, that the projected uh, spending level won't be the same uh, throughout time, right? So, so one thing you see here, is sort of this wave, um, what's been called the retirement smile uh, on the top line. And this creates uh, for portfolio withdrawals, um, a shape that we've called the retirement hatchet. So you see at the beginning of the plan, we kind of see the head of the hatchet. Um, and then we go into the handle. It's actually a very nice ergonomic handle because of the, uh, the retirement smile. And this is not at all a strange um, scenario. It, it's, it's fairly common in this case for people pushing Social Security out um, a few years or maybe all the way to age 70. Um, you see this quite often. And these kind of realistic uh, situations make applying some of the, um, the kind of going ideas for uh, dynamic retirement planning uh, less and less useful, even to the point where, where they really just, just won't work. Um, so that's what we'll be, be talking about today. So there are so many possible approaches to dynamic income planning that are in the literature, that are in you know, financial planning journals and so on, that we, we're certainly not going to um, you know, go over them all today. Uh, but in kind of reviewing the quote unquote traditional approaches to dynamic income planning, probably the wrong word to use since uh, um, dynamic income planning has not been around all that long. Um, but when reviewing them, we usually can, can find that there are some set of triggers for adjustments, right? So sort of a, hey, why would, when and why would I make an adjustment? And then a, okay, and what do we do given that we do need an adjustment? So for example, um, you might have an adjustment trigger based on portfolio balance. You might see something like, um, okay, if my portfolio balance ever reaches 150% of my beginning balance, uh, you know, maybe in inflation adjusted terms, then I'll be allowed to increase my income. Um, you might see something like tracking withdrawal rates over time. Uh, this is probably the most commonly um, you know, attempt for advisors who who, who attempt uh, a, a real systematic dynamic income planning. This is often um, something that uh, that I've encountered. So you'll track withdrawal rate over time. If it gets too high, meaning the amount of money you're taking compared to your balance um, is is too high, reduce income. If it gets too low, the amount of money you're taking divided by your account balance gets too low because the account balance has gone up. Um, then you'll increase income. Um, or there are also a variety of methods that um, fall under the rubric of RMD methods that just say, okay, over time, we'll kind of try to keep track of, um, of, of life expectancy and adjust uh, withdrawals based on that. Um, each of these has merit to it. Um, in particular, the last one is we'll, we'll go over some, some, uh, some of the, the, the issues behind the scenes on it. Um, but we'll also see that uh, there are problems. Um, and then if you look at how adjustments are made, sometimes um, it will, we'll see something like, you know, uh, increase uh, income by 10%, decrease it by 10%, some sort of, you know, some sort of number that's, that's preset, or you might see a floor or ceiling um, that'll say, hey, I'll never go above maybe 10 or 20% more than I started with or below a certain amount. Uh, anytime we set a floor, of course, on, on income, we, we do bring the possibility of actually running out of money in um, to, the, to the situation. So that's, uh, that's not always the, the greatest idea. And then finally, um, we might see something like, uh, you know, if, if it seems like we're taking too much, we'll skip an inflation adjustment. Um, the, uh, 
the apparent advantage of the, the last one is um, that's a way of kind of decreasing income without it being obvious uh, to clients, right? So it doesn't seem as painful if somebody skips an inflation adjustment as if they actually get a, a decrease in their income. Um, these sort of traditional approaches can, can seem to have benefits. So they seem easy to manage because the, the, the rules can be stated often very fairly simply, right, with actual numbers. Um, and those rules tend to have some kind of intuitive link to risk, uh, right? So if my uh, withdrawal rate is getting too high, well, maybe that my risk is getting high. Um, and they've been treated pretty extensively in research. So you can find you know, writing on this, uh, which is nice. The challenges that we'll see is there's a fair amount in, in most of these of kind of arbitrariness, by which I mean a, a lack of a link between the approach and the rule itself or the, the, the system itself and what we're really trying to accomplish, which is kind of keeping a client's retirement on track with all of the information that we actually know about them at, at that time. So we're going to go through an example of this. Um, this arbitrariness can actually lead to some real problems. So it, it can actually end up triggering adjustments in the wrong direction for clients, which is almost sort of the worst nightmare for, for doing this kind of planning is if, if an advisor is giving advice on making an income adjustment, we, we'd hope it's at least in the right direction. Um, but, but there are scenarios that where that wouldn't be true. And the biggest challenge that we'll go over is these don't scale very easily to realistic client situations. So we'll kind of group the first two problems together, the arbitrariness and, and the, the wrong direction problem. And, and uh, we'll actually look at kind of that basic client situation again. I know um, at the beginning, I was saying what's important is that this, uh, that any approach to dynamic income will scale across client situations and across time. And that's definitely true. But these first problems actually apply even to the simple income plan, this sort of um, toy, um, simplistic uh, approach. So we'll go through an example um, of an arbitrary rule. So let's say that we had a, a million dollar portfolio withdrawing $45,000 a year adjusted for inflation with a legacy goal of $250,000 adjusted for inflation. And we're going to really simplify this and say that annual returns are 5% a year and inflation is 3% a year. Um, Obviously, this is a, a extremely simplified and not the kind of thing we we typically would see. Uh, but it by simplifying it, we can we can see uh, the problem with with the rule we'll have. And the rule is um, oh, and I think I missed. There's there's also a section in here in red where returns go from positive uh, five percent real returns to negative negative one percent returns. Now we're going to apply a rule which says skip inflation adjustments following years with negative real returns. Um, this is a, a, an actual rule you'll, you'll find um, explored in, in the literature. And in, the, in this situation, we, we end up with then nine years of income reductions. Um, but it turns out those income reductions are, um, they're unnecessary. So we end up with 11 years of reduced income at 26% less income than we started with. Um, the problem is, in fact, after those first 11 years of reasonably good returns, the situation we were in was not one where we needed to reduce income if things looked bad, like if there were a negative year, but actually we were kind of ahead of plan, right? So if we had reevaluated in year 10, we'd have said, wow, things are looking good. Things have turned out better than we expected. In fact, we could have afforded an income increase at this point. Um, and we might think, well, that's it's only in retrospect at the end of the plan, but actually at this point, um, it would have been clear that we were ahead of plan, right? So even returning to sort of our, our comfort level at the beginning of the plan, our comfort level risk-wise, we would have increased income. So this kind of rule about skipping an inflation adjustment, because it's, it's sort of arbitrary in a way, it's, 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 it's um, separated from all of the, the facts on the ground, it leads us to, to go in the wrong direction. Um, now you might say, okay, well, you're kind of picking on the skipping an inflation adjustment issue and there are other approaches to this and, and that's, that's definitely fair enough. Um, probably the, the most commonly used uh, approach in practice to dynamic income planning focuses on the withdrawal rate that a client is taking. Um, 
So you'll set kind of a target withdrawal rate. Um, let's, in this example, we'll say maybe our target is 4.7% withdrawals. And then you'll set withdrawal rates that would trigger um, a return to that target. So maybe if we hit six, we'll go down to 4.7. If we hit four, we'll go back up to 4.7. Um, the advantages of this are that now we actually are tracking progress over time, right? So the last example where we were skipping inflation adjustments, we one of the problems was we never returned to say, well, yeah, but what are the facts on the ground? You know, how have things changed over time, right? So triggering it with a negative year, well, a negative year might be per perfectly fine if it follows on positive years or if if we've if a lot of time has passed, right? Um, so there is a, an element where we're tracking progress here, and it's not linked to that kind of arbitrariness of the inflation rate. So this seems like a, a possibly uh, better way to go. But the problem is, although the plan is being applied dynamically, meaning we can we can test those withdrawal rates over time, every month, every year, however often, uh, and make those adjustments when the plan calls for it, the, the triggers, the withdrawal rates themselves um, are static. So we would be applying that 6% um, guardrail, you know, now let's say we're age 60 and the same guardrail at uh, 70 or 80. Um, there are systems, by the way, that will stop applying guardrails at, at some very future age. Um, but again, that's a fairly arbitrary point as well. Um, and the fact is though, that, that the risk of particular withdrawal rates actually changes over time as plan length changes. Um, that, that's fairly fairly obvious at the beginning of retirement, right? Generally, we would expect different advice you know, if somebody came to you for the first time retiring at age 60 as if they came to you at age 75, right? You would expect different, um, different results. Um, and so the problem with applying these static guardrails, even if they're applied dynamically, meaning over time, is that we're not recognizing that fact. We're not, we're not applying the change in risk over time. So let's say that our target here were this green line um, which is about the 4.7% withdrawal rate. Um, the, the blue box here is set at 6%, right? So even if our withdrawal rate followed the green line, right? So over time, our portfolio balance is going down a little bit. And eventually our initial withdrawals continued through time reach, they're now 6% of the portfolio, they're not 4.7. At about it looks like year you know 76, 77 here, that would have happened. And so this rule, decrease income if withdrawal rate hits six percent, would trigger a reduction down to to four point seven again. The problem is risk in that hypothetical situation hasn't changed at all, right? The 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 risk of a six percent withdrawal rate at at sixty at seventy seven, for example, is the same as the risk of a of a four point seven withdrawal rate at age sixty five. So it's inappropriate to reduce income at that point, right? We haven't, we haven't, um, although we have continued to test, we haven't updated um, our kind of picture of the world to recognize how risk has changed um, for, for this client. So even in the simple situation where the only retirement income we have is withdrawals from a portfolio, applying withdrawal rate guardrails in this kind of static way um, can lead to problems. The third problem that I mentioned was realistic client situation. So now let's add some complexity to, to the situation. Um, one piece of complexity is what if we're planning for our spending needs to change over time as we age? So this is a, 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 common, um, a, a, a common finding in research. Um, Probably David Blanchett's uh, work on the retirement smile might be the, the, the most well known, although there's there's other research on this, on kind of how people spend money uh, over time. Often early in retirement, they'll spend more when they're healthy and active and you know have some newfound free time. Uh, we may even see spending go up year over year on an inflation adjusted basis, but then slowly it will it will tend to diminish for some people on an inflation adjusted basis. If we, if we added inflation in here, what you, what you tend to see is actually just, it may go up a bit, but not as quickly as inflation does. And then um, some increases late in life, um, possibly for, for, for medical purposes and so on. 
Um, and planning in this way, just just kind of recognizing that you know age based spending may be may be different in my 80s and 90s than it is in my 60s, actually has a huge effect on the available income early in retirement. So where this is appropriate for for clients, it can have a huge effect. Um, generally, are almost a 20 percent increase in income early in retirement in, in po possible spending early in retirement. So not uh, a rounding error. So if, if you were trying to apply um, this kind of planning, um, but also apply dynamic guardrails using withdrawal rates, you'd run into a really difficult situation. So let's imagine we started at point one here, the, 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 the circle with the one in it, taking $174,000 a year. Um, we're targeting a 5.7% withdrawal rate at this point that is reflecting these, these kind of uh, newfound gains from, from using the smile. And our decrease uh, guardrail is at 7%, our increased guardrail is at uh, 4.3. These again are all adjusted for, for the expectations from the smile. Well, what happens when we get to about um, 11 or 12 years later, um, and if we followed this plan, and we're now taking $150,000 a year, inflation adjusted again, right? It's probably more than we started with uh, in, in nominal dollars. Um, what would we do? Um, if our balance has kept up, in fact, grown to 3.8 million, our withdrawal rate would now be 3.9%. That's below the income increase guardrail of 4.3. And so the guardrail would say, raise your income. But the problem is that reduction in income was actually planned, right? That, that, that was an expected reduction in spending. So what should we do? We would also almost need to distinguish between planned changes in withdrawal rate versus unplanned. Um, it would become really difficult to apply these static um, um, kind of set in stone at the beginning uh, numbers, these withdrawal rate numbers, it, it, it really just becomes untenable. And it becomes even more untenable when we add in the fact that uh, most households will have other sources of funding their spending in retirement than just their portfolios, most commonly social security, but often, often other things as well, a pension, maybe some, some part-time work. And so on, and and in this case, if we're also doing the smile, just to just to add in all the complexity we can, the planned withdrawals from the portfolio differ hugely over time. So in this case, initially, uh, these clients would be taking sixty-seven thousand dollars a year from a portfolio. Um, it then goes to fifty-five thousand as the plan change when Mary starts Social Security. Um, when John starts Social Security, we're we're down to twenty-four thousand dollars in planned withdrawals, and then because of the smile, much later on, we're planning for only ten thousand five hundred a year. Um, and so, at this point, setting withdrawal rate guardrails, so using rates, um, can be uh, again totally impractical. This off, often is also a a a, a, um, a difficulty, and you know we tend to be anchored to this withdrawal rate research, things like the 4% the rule and so on. But when applying it to a, um, an actual realistic example, those intuitions that we've developed by being anchored to that research, um, we kind of need to throw them out the window. So in this case, if this were a million dollar portfolio, we might say, well, wait a second, you know, 6.7% sounds like a crazy withdrawal rate. Um, and it might be if that were the only thing going on, right? But because of the hatchet shape here, um, that's that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, we might see withdrawal rates of six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent, uh, and and that may not be a risky thing to do given the the planned changes later on. So, I, I guess the the um, the lesson here, if we're trying to apply dynamic income planning, which we know has a lot of value for clients to realistic situations is we, we have to move beyond um, some of these uh, you know, more some simple approaches like withdrawal rate guardrails. Um, we need something that allows us to update our understanding of a client situation at each point, and that's directly linked to the risk of a client situation at any given time. 
Um, so thankfully uh, for clients who work with advisors, it is not a one and done, set it and forget it um, process to do to, to handle your, re your retirement um, funding. It's a it's an ongoing process. And so an advisor needs a way to 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 know what the risk is at any given point and then set thresholds. You know, if risk gets too high, counsel a reduction in spending. If risk gets too low, because that's that is also certainly something that can happen, um, let the client know that they actually could afford um, to, to spend more, to loosen the belt, so to speak. Um, and then if those points are hit, um, the advisor would ideally have a plan for what how adjustments would be made, right? So these wouldn't be arbitrary. Um, but again, we can actually use risk level, you know, to move to or toward a particular risk level when we make that adjustment. Um, and this concept of, of income risk or holistic risk um, has a lot of advantages, um, especially the advantage that it can be applied over time to any situation and include the effects of all sorts of complexity, um, portfolio balance changes, asset allocation, fees, expenses, legacy goals, um, those planned spending changes, other cash flow, social security, and so on can all be grouped in here so that an advisor can understand not so much, you know, just what a portfolio withdrawal rate makes sense, but really what the whole, what holistic income level, what total income level uh, works for a client. Um, so one way to think about this, and this is definitely, uh, you know, treading into maybe a more sophisticated view, um, but something that could be really useful for advisors to understand about making income or considering different income options for a client is that for any given risk level, and you could think of this as, you know, probability of success or probability of adjustment or probability of failure, um, for any given risk level, there is an income, right? So what we're doing in providing advice to a client is, is uh, on retirement income is saying, you know, what's sort of your risk tolerance, your tolerance for adjustment compared to how much income that would provide you, how much spending, what sort of standard of living that provides you in retirement. And choices can be made along this curve, right? So you can see here that, that this is generally the shape of this income risk curve. And we'll make uh, recommendations of income based on that trade-off, right? It is a trade-off. We can take less risk, but there's a cost for that. It's a cost of standard of living. We could have higher standard of living, but there's a cost for that. It's the cost of higher risk. Uh, there's no right answer. It's much like developing advice on uh, portfolio allocation, right? Sort of what what is the tolerance and ability of a, of a household for, um, for risk. And then we can set our guardrails using exactly the same concept. So we could say, if the risk of our current behavior, you know, goes down enough, if we go from, you know, 20 to 10 or five or zero, well, they can afford an income increase. If the risk of their current behavior, you know, updated for all their current longevity and so on, um, ever goes up enough, maybe it's to 60, 70, 80, well, we'll reduce our income. And the nice thing is this, this pulls everything together in kind of one risk concept. Um, Derek and I actually have a, an article coming out soon um, about this, um, diving a little bit deeper in, into this concept. But probably the most important thing is, I mean, maybe for a few uh, clients, uh, some, a visual like that would work. What we generally want to do is once we've done that kind of um, analysis on what, what someone's risk is and our adjustments warranted, we want to pull it back into a client communication strategy at, at a level of abstraction that works for, for most clients. And as often as possible, we would like that to be in dollar terms. So um, many of you will have seen this before, but um, we can talk about, okay, so your, your income and, and at Income Lab, we do this monthly. Um, your income is X, but, and, and your current portfolio is in this case, 2.2 million. But if that balance were to go up by a certain amount, in this case, 5%, um, you could spend a little more, right? In this case, about $700. Or if that balance were to go down in this case by 20%, um, we would be counseling a reduction in income. All of that is based on the holistic risk concept that I just went over. Um, but we're not having to kind of uh, 
bring a client with us into all of the you know complexities of analysis and statistics, right? We're, we're really communicating with them at a level that they that they understand. Um, often this is sort of the the situation that we'll see, especially early in retirement, and and um, discussing things in terms of dollar amounts can really go a long way toward client understanding and, and confidence in the plan. Um, that's sort of setting short-term expectations. We also um, using uh, dynamic holistic risk guardrails in this way, we can simulate an, a long-term experience. So what if you know over the next 20 or 30 years, you increase income and decrease income using holistic risk um, and try to set expectations for clients or, or paint a picture of the geography they could be traveling through. So um, in this uh, visual, you're seeing kind of a long-term experience presentation. Okay, if we adopt a plan like this, we might expect to be a, a that your total income over your lifetime would be above what we're currently planning on. Uh, if it is above, maybe you know an average of twenty six percent in this case, but it could also be below. But we can also set expectations or or paint a little bit more uh, picture on on magnitude on the downside. So in this simulation for this example household, 12% of the time they did end up with total lifetime income below the original plan, but on average it was only 3% below. And in the worst case, it was 12% below. Um, neither of which are particularly comfortable, but um, uh, definitely not uh, you know, failure. So the advantage of going from you know, withdrawal rate guardrails or, you know, skipping inflation adjustments and so on to a holistic view of income risk is it's actually easy to communicate when done in dollar terms. Um, and from an advisor standpoint, it, it handles the complexity of real life. So you're able to apply that across a client population and through life, right? 60 year olds and 80 year olds um, and situations with complex um, cash flows and so on. Um, the challenges are you need more robust analytical tools, but that's it's it's worth the the challenge essentially because of the the um, the ability to to make sure we're really handling realistic client situations, right? Not um, kind of for our convenience, ignoring particular parts of the client situation, but really giving um, um, customized. Uh, advice. And again, uh, Derek and I have, a, have uh, an article, um, probably a series of articles actually uh, um, dealing a little bit more with these, these kinds of concepts um, in, in, the next, uh, in the next couple months. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy those. Um, so Derek, I know you um, uh, apply this in, in your own practice and uh, you, know, you and I have worked quite a bit on, uh, on these concepts. So I'll, I'll open it up to you. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the the real challenge is with you know, uh, thinking about and talking about this is there's really two different conversations going on. I think Justin's alluded to that well in that on the one hand, there's the, you know, uh, as an advisor, analytically, you know, what can we do to provide the best kind of strategy and plan going into retirement? Uh, but then on the other side, there's the actual in practice, you know, what, what are we communicating to the client? And, you know, a, a unique kind of tension here, right, is like we're we're talking about doing some really sophisticated stuff on the the analytical side, uh, you know, actually going much deeper, you know, beyond just a basic Monte Carlo type simulation. But at the same time, we're bringing it back to a report, you know, that ideally should be simple and easy to understand. And so, communicating in dollar terms, uh, you know, showing the guardrails, that income adjustment plan, like that, to me, you know, when I'm when I'm working with a client, that's really where the focus is at. Um, you know, sometimes looking at that long term. Uh, income, um, the long-term income experience, just to make sure we have the right sort of plan in place. Um, if it's somebody that does feel inclined to take more or less risk uh, for that higher or lower income, uh, that's a, a conversation we can have with some actual metrics to kind of put behind it. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, it all boils down to these, you know, these total risk guardrails. And um, once, you know, once I'm meeting with clients, this is really generally what I'm actually focused on. And I'm not getting into the details of you know, all the complexities behind the scene and you know, the spending curve and all, all those different things that um, you know, are there. But at the same time, my, my clients are benefiting from that in terms of setting guardrails that I think are, are better for them. Uh, but also just at the end of the day, getting the, the report here. So um, 
Uh, I'm sure there, there might be a few questions, but to, to me, that's is something to keep in mind is that there's always these two different, um, there's the analytical side and what we're doing as advisors. There's the communication side and what we're actually showing the clients. And those should probably be you know, very different sets of information. Okay, Malkley, I think we can uh, open it up to some, to some Q and A. Uh, I see we already have two questions in here. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in our Q&A um, awesome. and uh, watch other people's questions because you can also um, like them and, and move them up in the queue as well. But yeah, starting off, uh, first question is, what's an appropriate method to set the thresholds? For instance, a couple with two pensions and two social security checks that need very little from their portfolio could have a much lower Monte Carlo success rate than a couple that relies on their investments for most of their income and requires a higher money Carlos success rate. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. It goes to the um, that fact that things can be really idiosyncratic. Um, Derek, do you have do you have some thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, for me, there's definitely. I think what this is primarily getting at is that there's the whole magnitude of adjustment or you know, the failure there, right? Where if you've got two pensions, two social security checks, you don't need much from your um, portfolio. I actually, I work with a surprising number of clients that are in that exact type of situation where I'm running these projections for them and they may not even necessarily want to be, um, you know, spending at that level, but this definitely provides some, um, you know, ways to look at projections in terms of estate balance conversations there. What is the goal, right? If, um, you know, it, uh, I don't know that I adjust the thresholds necessarily. You can go in and adjust the, uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by thresholds, but there is the income risk setting adjustment. Um, you know, I do find that as a general rule, I think people tend to err on the side of uh, if they don't have to take risk, they wouldn't like to. So when I can bump those, you know, over to a more conservative type of plan in that scenario where it's really more upside and not, you know, they're really focused on that growing um, their wealth. I mean, that, that's something I can have as part of a conversation, but, um, yeah, I might be getting too, too hung up a little bit on the details of the question here, but I think that, uh, definitely you want to have that income experience conversation. And then when, when you have that person who doesn't have much portfolio need, then you can talk about giving and, um, you know, even the guardrails keeping you on track for a giving plan, uh, so that their estate balance doesn't get, uh, so large, unless that's what they want. But I find that, you know, many people would rather give while they're here and alive um, and, and able to, to experience that than just uh, accumulate a massive estate. Yeah, and what I've often seen, I don't know, if Derek, in your experience, if you've seen, if you have seen this as well. So for that situation where, where a substantial amount of your, um, of, of your desired spending or, or, or kind of your, your retirement um, lifestyle can be funded by non-portfolio um, cash flows, so security pensions and so on. What I will often see is those the guardrails, when expressed in dollar terms, um, will be uh, they look a little more friendly than if it were all portfolio. So you you may see that oh wow, it would actually take quite a reduction in my portfolio for me to need to reduce my income. Um, and therefore my portfolio withdrawals. The reason being that, well, the portfolio is not doing the heavy lifting, right? So it, it's sort of, you, you've always got these other income sources. And so and that would be reflected when using holistic risk guardrails. Um, essentially, uh, you would see it happen here in the kind of client communication, what are the dollar amounts? But, you know, one reason for it is also, um, you know, the risk curve, right? The, the concept of what, you know, how risk would change over time for that for that household is very different than somebody who is funding all of their um, lifestyle from, from portfolio withdrawals. And then I've also seen vice versa that, I mean, in this case, the, the income increase plan is quite close. All it takes is a 5% increase in this case. But um, I, I believe I've also seen that, that you know, the upward adjustments might be a little more accessible, a little more likely um, when you're not depending so heavily on on portfolio, basically, because sequence of return risk is just not as high for that for that couple, right? 
Uh, next question is, do the guardrails float as conditions change in an implemented plan? Or once a plan is implemented, are the guardrails fixed until the portfolio balances hit them? So they, they do change over time. So what, what you, the, the dollar amounts change over time. The risk levels do not. So imagine a situation where, you know, you have a million dollar portfolio, nothing else, right? Um, and you're 65 years old. And then imagine 10 years later, you, you've managed to still keep a million dollar portfolio, but now your plan is much shorter. So just with that very simple example, it, it, it would be intuitive that we wouldn't want the dollar-based guardrails to stay exactly the same because, um, you know, kind of like we saw with uh, with this example, right? Things do change over time due to due to plan length. So now they wouldn't change drastically month to month or maybe even year to year. But if we start looking at you know five ten year differences, you would want them to kind of slowly slowly. Um, uh, creep in the right direction, right? So in, in that situation, um, essentially the, uh, the income guardrails would have been getting more and more attractive, right? So, uh, you know, 10 years later for this couple, um, I would expect that, uh, that downward income adjustment trigger to be much lower, right? Because now we were funding a shorter expected lifetime, and so um, we wouldn't have the same dollar-based trigger. Um, that being said, I know, Derek, you probably have some thoughts on this too. I don't think it's dangerous at all to kind of, you know, state a, a, a kind of a rounded version of this guardrail and say, hey, you know, this is sort of a short-term expectation. Feel free to think about it and, and keep it in your head, but we'll kind of update that over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was actually going to make just that exact point. In practice, when I give... Um, you know, because for, for most of my clients, um, you know, the kind of the, when I present the guardrails to them, to me, the, the software is still there. I'm still looking at the software, but I'm, you know, it depends on the client, but I'm generally not even necessarily sharing access to the, the guardrails there. And so in my client's mind, it probably is a pretty static, right? We delivered it. They've got the guardrails from our last meeting. They know where those guardrails were at. Now, if we hit a guardrail, um, you know, some of those things that are changing in the background, they're just not seeing uh, even though that's staying up to date. And then when we go to do an annual plan update or um, you know, maybe we do hit a guardrail and we have to make some changes or we, we thought we hit a guardrail, but maybe things have changed since then, um, then we'll have a, a conversation about updating that plan. So I would say in my client's mind, I'm kind of rounding some of these numbers, presenting uh, some guardrails they probably view as more fixed, even though the software itself is keeping it dynamically updated, uh, basically giving the, the best estimate available at that point in time. And next question is, are the short-term expectations of the income adjustment plan assuming 100% success rate? So, uh, no, they're, they're, they're definitely not. They're always based on this, this concept of holistic risk. And the risk guardrails can be set. It, it's, a, it's a lot like coming up with a, with an investment policy for a, for a household, right? So, you know, how are we invested? You know, when would we make changes? When would we rebalance and so on? It's very similar for, for income, right? We're finding kind of a comfortable balance between um, the ability and, and desire to accept risk, which in the income world is the risk of a, a downward adjustment, right? It's not the risk of failure. So we you won't see the words failure and, and success in in the software, but so it's always about finding something that fits the client situation. Um, and so even the adjustment plan, you could put those closer or farther away, depending on what the client's preferences would be. As Derek said, in practice, we, we, we've usually seen that um, clients kind of, uh, you know, risk aversion or loss aversion um, will lead them to desire something more like you see here, where the upside is closer, the downside is farther away. Um, you know, we're not kind of splitting the difference, um, but it, it, you can really, you can tailor it to whatever the client's, um, you know, desires are. There may be young clients who say, hey, I'd rather live a little now. Fine, tell me if, if, if you know, the party needs to stop um, and, and they might want more income or vice versa. You might have someone who says, look, I never want a negative phone call from you. Please be very conservative. Um, oh, Derek, do you have thoughts there? Yep, no, I, I agree there. And then just one additional note in terms of if you're ever wondering 
where those, um, you know, what those uh, kind of guardrail thresholds are, you can go into the advanced settings um, and you can see for that given strategy or whatever you have implemented for the client where those risk levels are. Um, because yeah, the hundred percent success rate isn't going to be the, uh, uh, the norm. I, I don't even on the most conservative, Justin, do you know off the top of your head? Yeah. The, if, you, if you pull the slider on the income setting all the way to the left, um, that is what, what we call a risk, risk zero. Um, you know, it's always estimated risk. Of course, you know, no one ever knows exactly what the, what the risk is, but it's, it's risk within the model. And then, so that means basically if, if risk then is basically below zero, right? <laughs> if your current behavior is is uh, more conservative than anything that the model thinks is possible, at some point, uh, the, the the income plan will be well. You know, go ahead and return to zero, right? Uh, pull yourself back to that very very risk averse level. Um, yeah, and I think on the slider, the highest income risk is forty. So it's saying it's still not splitting the difference. It's saying you know, 40% chance of that this is too much, 60% chance that it's, uh, that, that we'll get a, an, an increase in the future. But as Derek said, you can always go in and fine tune those things in the advanced settings. Next question here is, uh, what instrument is best for assessing holistic risk? I'll give my kind of, you know, take on this. I, I'm not a huge fan of like risk tolerance questionnaires personally, I mean, obviously they have, um, you know, some compliance reasons and uh, other reasons that uh, they're, they're still very popular. But for me, I think it's hard to beat just a good conversation and actually having a conversation about these types of income adjustments. So going to the long-term experience and saying, you know, would you, what kind of which of these you could compare, you know, side by side, a more aggressive and a less, less aggressive type strategy. And you know which of these sounds more appealing to you? And, and having that conversation, um, to me, I've just always found that an actual client conversation is far more valuable than what numbers somebody gave themselves on a questionnaire or where they um, uh, put themselves. So that's what I personally rely on uh, is more using using the plan output to actually have some of that conversation about risk rather than trying to assess risk from a questionnaire. I don't know. Uh, next question is, uh, given that retirement planning is by nature long-term and that the variables are generally not likely to substantially change month to month, wouldn't this approach fit better in a year-to-year -year review, quarter-to-quarter -quarter perhaps, than monthly? So I think there's, I'll, I'll let Justin way in too, but I think there's two different ways to think about this. Again, there's the actual client uh, implementation. Like I'm not, I'm not giving my clients a month to month update. Here's how your guardrails changed in the past month. That is much more of an annual update and review unless something prompts it, right? If a client calls me and they, they want to take a large distribution to buy an RV or whatever it might be. Okay. We'll go run, you know, how does that change your guardrails? But I'm not going to just say, Hey, you know, this past month, here's how it changed. Uh, that automatic update for me is more a benefit as kind of a professional in, in terms of the, um, you know, it's, it's automatically updating for me. If I need to go in and see where a client's plan is updated, if I need to go in and, um, you know, put in that scenario where we take out an extra 200,000 from the portfolio or whatever it might be, I can quickly do that. And the plan is updated and ready to go. Um, and that's the value to me more than telling the client their guardrails have changed over the past month. Yeah, I would add, um, like, this is a really practical question. And I, and I, I agree with everything Derek just said. The, the software, the Income Lab software, updates uh, plans that are set to be monitored. We call that an implemented plan. Updates those monthly. So pulls in new account balances. If you have data integrations, you know, moves everybody forward one month in time, right? Now we're one month closer to social security. We're one month older, everything is updated, right? Um, but for an implemented plan where you're in retirement, it is extremely unlikely that in any given month, there's anything to do, right? So that the monthly update is really just kind of making sure that we're, we're not, you know, the plan is not too far away from reality, 
Um, so because those guardrails, as you can see in this case, um, they take a, a, a decent amount of shift in your portfolio, um, it's unlikely that in any given month you would have um, an adjustment. It even comes down to there, there's a setting in the software for um, a minimum uh, income change, which is a purely practical setting that says how big would a change need to be for it to be worthwhile administratively, right? And so an example is for those implemented plans, we're tracking inflation, we're tracking how purchasing power has changed. Um, and every month we get a new CPI number, um, but you don't wanna call all of your clients and, and give them an extra $5 this month. Um, so even that is just a practical, um, a practical thing. I think in terms of cadence, um, often people who are doing this kind of dynamic planning are probably keeping a, a cadence similar to what you might've done before. Um, but the income lab software will make sure that the plan's always up to date and it will tap you on the shoulder if a plan that you have implemented is calling for a change, even an inflation adjustment. Um, it might say, hey, you know, since your last inflation adjustment, purchasing power has gone down by, you know, 5.5%. Your plan says, okay, at that point you would make an adjustment. Here's what the adjustment would be. Um, so in practice, I wouldn't, you know, expect monthly um, to, to make a, uh, your, your client communication monthly. I'm going to hop uh, to a two-part question in the chat um, as it just relates directly to what we're talking about with the guardrails. Uh, so two-part question. First question is, what are some of the factors that are taking into consideration in the total risk guardrails for clients, um, i.e., you know, annual inflation, mortality tables, his historically portfolio return, et cetera? Um, and then, uh, you know, what type of software slash programming can handle the interplay of these factors? So all of the examples you've seen at the end of, of this presentation are based on the Income Lab software. So it, Income Lab's dynamic retirement income planning is, is all based on these holistic risk measures. And that takes into account portfolio balance, asset allocation, fees, legacy goal, um, inflation, um, Plan spending changes, so retirement smile, for example, other cash flows, the inflation treatment of those cash flows, the timing of those cash flows, mortality adjustments for the two uh, people in a in a in a couple. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there are other things. There's economic uh, factors that weigh in certain uh, analyses if you want it. Um, so all of that is updated monthly and put together to form this concept of, of holistic risk. Yeah, about six minutes left. We have three more questions to, to kind of give you guys a heads up. Um, so the next question is, with clients having taxable, tax-deferred, and tax-free Roth accounts, can the software help optimize getting the most tax-efficient annual income? Does it allow for client-specific tax rates and allow for reflecting tax bases on taxable accounts to help with netable taxable account spending income. <laughs> yeah, there is a there's a whole section to the software that deals with taxes. Derek, do you want to? Uh, I was just going to say, if you go into the tax center, um, yeah, that'll that'll handle all of that. Um, even the baseline plans can be taking those tax rates and things into consideration. Um, but the tax center also you know, look at things like Roth conversion strategies. Automatically looks at kind of a nice big list of uh, considerable uh, strategies that you, you might want to think about and uh, shows you kind of the, the optimum within there. And, um, next question is, uh, say you want to pay off the mortgage over the first five years, which would create more of a retirement tomahawk rather than a hatchet. What considerations should be taken into account in that situation? It seems that guardrails don't change significantly if withdrawals above and beyond proposed income are planned. Um, so you can definitely model those situations, um, and it, it actually that that I would put those kind of into the the what if or A B testing um, realm. So it's it's easy enough to say, well, okay, well, actually, Derek had the example of you know what if I buy an RV, you know, how does that affect things? So it's easy to see um, here. Okay, well, what if we you know pay off our mortgage in the next five years? How would 
sort of the rest of our spending be affected by that versus, you know, maybe you have 10 years left on your mortgage or something, you can easily do kind of A-B testing there. Um, I would have to run the actual examples to see how it affects guardrails, but it, it definitely, it should. And we typically see that um, in a tomahawk situation where actually the, the, the total withdrawals are, um, or the total income in a sense, right, or total spending is, higher and then drops down because uh, an expense like that goes away. I generally do see the guardrails change. They may not change hugely, um, but maybe I one or 2% in, in, in a direction. And just one real quick thing to add to that is from a practical per perspective, you're actually, you are increasing the uh, sequence of returns risk, right? If, if that's like portfolio income, that's all coming at one shorter period in time, uh, that's going to be part of the income or the, the outcome, which, Sometimes you don't even see that impact so much in the guardrails. Uh, it's just something to be aware of uh, kind of behind the scenes as well. Yeah, you see the same thing with delaying social security, right? There, uh, there it's a little different because then social security is higher in the future, but but you will sometimes see that at interplay where if we're taking more withdrawals early on, you will see the guardrails shift a bit. Um, and uh, this question is, um, do you have any suggestions on applying this to a non-retainer client relationship? Um, not, not entirely sure what's meant by the non retainer Like, does that mean like a one-time plan? And, I'm doing like, it, not like an ongoing relationship. Yeah. Like a non-ongoing. Um, so it is, um, I've done some project work, um, you know, it, in cases like that, I actually did. Uh, I mentioned before, I don't, I don't necessarily share online access with a lot of my clients just cause I don't think a lot of them are going to go in and do that. But when I did like a one-time plan, that actually was a case where I did get them set up online so that they, they could see the guardrails changing over time. Um, they could continue to have some access to that. So that might be a consideration is, um, it is difficult though. I mean, like a withdrawal rates driven guardrails approach, much easier for somebody to kind of self-manage even though there's all the limitations of that compared to something like this where you really need the analytical tools to do it. it just <laughs> one last one coming in, uh, and then we'll close it off there. Um, is there a big age difference between spouses and the cash flow? Um, and the cash flow assume, and the cash flow assumes social security pension or annuity payments going beyond the reasonable life expectancy of the older spouse. Does this mean that the plan portfolio withdrawals could be lower than is necessary after the older spouse dies? How would you explain the income sources in the cash flow graph to the client? Yeah. Um, so uh, behind the scenes, when, when you're getting these numbers, the proposed income, the guardrails and so on, the income lab system is taking into account that different mortality expectations for the, for the two spouses. So, and you would see that, especially in these, um, you know, big age differences, but really you'd see them even in, in, in couples who are closer together in age. Um, so that is definitely a, a a really important thing, uh, you know, uh, assuming that everyone really does make it to the end of the plan will artificially increase the income that you think they can have or the spending you think they can have, right? So it's really important to make that adjustment when you're coming up with these risk guardrails. So in the example um, where there's maybe a 10 or 15 year difference, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes in the analytics, um, you know, maybe somebody's 70 and the plan is, uh, you know, uh, 25 or 30 years because the younger person, you know, is, is, might be alive at that point. Well, toward the end of the plan, whatever social security is due to that older individual is, is probably having very little effect anymore, right? Uh, we're, there, it's not assuming that, that that income is still available. We actually did a, um, a webinar on mortality adjustments in, um, in dynamic planning, and we'll probably re, re, uh, reboot that um, over probably sometime this year, uh, probably also with CE credit. Um, so, uh, but in the meantime, um, we do have that available on the website. Well, Derek and Justin, as always, thank you guys so much uh, for another great webinar. Um, and then for our attendees still here, we will send out an email um, with the recording link as well. And um, quick reminder that we have our next CE webinar on April 26th. There's the link uh, in the chat to register for that webinar. Um, and you'll also have that link in the follow-up email um, for this recording link. Outside of that, thank you all so much. Thank you for the great questions and great comments. And we will look forward uh, to seeing you all on the next one. Have a wonderful day, everyone.
Everybody.